Get ready for a progressive voice. The voice of Samantha Clemens. Right here on The Revolution. AM 1510. The Samantha Clemens Show. Well, as you can tell by the voice, I'm either Samantha Clemens doing a Kathleen Turner impression or it's Richard S. Casimer doing a Kathleen Turner impression. The smart money is on the latter. And like any self-respecting guest host, I came with my own intro music. Hit it, Professor. Who am I? Richard Casimer, media veteran. Why I got in radio is because I'm good with a knife. Contributor in Perth, Australia. Our friend Richard Casimer in the United States. How are you guys enjoying the 19th century? Is that working out for you? How can you say, I'm not making fun of you as a race, I'm making fun of you as black performers? The Republicans, very much like Christian fundamentalists who can quote scripture backward and forward, comprehending it is another matter. Anytime you read the Constitution to our dumbed down America, that's a good thing. I think as a country, Americans are as patriotic as the most rabid UK football hooligan. He's doing two shows a day. He's got a tab at Katz's Deli. And he may have a chonky column. It's a bipartisan incompetency. Determination of the offense is not on the offender, but the offended. When you call a man an SOB, that has more to do with his mother exactly. than it does you. The upside is all the Nazis breathe a sigh of relief. They're no longer the slander du jour. Who am I? Richard S. Kesma. We've all learned a valuable lesson today that as Americans, we need to work on our obscenities. I am indeed Richard S. Casimer, sitting in for the traveling Samantha Clemens. A pleasure to be back on AM 1510 Revolution Boston. Numbers to call to join in the conversation today, 617-237-1234, 617-237-1234. Toll free, 866-338-9663. Our subject today is puffball media or softball media. Are reporters and journalists giving too many passes to too many people on too many topics by avoiding the hard questions as well as allowing blatant lies and distortions, particularly by political candidates, to go unchecked. Is it lazy, complacent journalism? Is it a mandate edict by the right-wing conservative corporate media? And how does this new normal affect the small market journalists that we rely on to get the facts of what's going on around us? Is now this taking over their aspect on how to gather news either from their vantage point or from the people that they're actually interviewing that may have been watching, let's say, Fox News, for example, and expecting to get a pass. We're going to be talking with Tony Shinella soon during the first half hour. He's a regular here on Samantha's show. Get his take on it. We would like to get your opinion, your input on this, because you are the consumer. You're the people who are getting this news. Is it okay for you? Are you happy with the level of discourse that you're getting or lack thereof on some of these talk shows, especially the Sunday morning shows? Are you getting enough information? And are you finding yourself having to do more research to get to the bottom of the issues? Or, again, are you complacent? Is the information that you're getting sufficient for you? Do you not care? Is there a general malaise in the public where we don't care? That we're so inundated with 24-7 news media that it's all the same. Whether it's a lie, whether it's a fact, it's kind of hard to tell the difference. Years ago, I believe it was uh, Daniel Patrick Moynihan from New York that said that everyone's entitled to their own opinion, but they're not entitled to their own set of facts. It seems to be that especially now in the news media where you have politicians on that are blatantly skewing the topics to suit their political agenda, whether it's the economy, whether it's the war against women, or as the GOP is saying, that it doesn't exist, or they're blaming our illustrious president that he's responsible for the war against women, whether it's immigration, you name it, that their set of facts outweighs the true set of facts, and especially when it comes to the economy, because numbers don't lie. Now, there's an argument that say that anything that comes out of any administration's numbers, whether it's the job reports, the economy, the national debt, or whatever, that that administration holds the key. They hold the cards so they can cook the books, as it were, to suit their agenda. But at some point, there is, in life, most of the time, there is no gray area. It's black or it's white. It's right or it's wrong. And jumbling these facts around to suit an agenda just doesn't cut it. But we want your opinion on that. So give us a call, 617-237- 1234. On the line with me now is uh, uh, Tony Chanella. He's a local editor for the Concord, New Hampshire Patch and Politizine.com, a fantastic online magazine. You've got to jump on it. Tony, thanks so much for coming on today. How are you? 
Hey, hey, thanks for having me on. How are you? I'm doing fine for an old man. You know, Tony, it's an admitted fact by Fox News President Roger Ailes. Now, I'm, I'm not going to slam Fox any more than I have to. I'm all in favor of the broad brush when it comes to media. But Roger Ailes ha- has openly admitted that Fox is the media arm of the GOP. That's what it was set up to do, and that's what they've accomplished. Very successfully. Now, during the George Bush administration, George W. Bush, the White House regularly sent Fox talking points that the network read verbatim as if it was emanating from the Fox News desk. Can we agree on that? Well, I mean, let's look. Verbatim is a, is a, let's say, 90%. Okay. (laughs) Well, and... I mean, they did tweak a little bit of the talking points, a little bit. Okay, but when you when you have when you have the the White House uh, press secretary uh, reading his or her talking points, and then you have Fox News reporting the same talking points, and then you have a GOP congressperson senator reading the same talking points using the same verbiage, you have to know that it's more than a coincidence. And so, <laughs> yeah, and, and the, not, go ahead. I don't argue that. Yes. Um, and the Fox host and the GOP usual suspects, they, they still engage to this day in, in the evening and the Sunday morning bloviating. The ritual of the Q&A spoon feeding, as does NBC's David Gregory with that often pre-digested meet the press that he's done since Tim Russert passed away. Now, yeah. you as, as yeah, a... Those programs have been that way for a long time. I mean, and if you even go, you know, this week with ABC News, um, back in the day, you know, it's the same for people, you know, occasionally you would get, you know, Cokie in there once in a while, <laughs> but I mean, it was the same, it's the same people, the same talking points, the same ideas, uh, uh, the same beltway opinions. I mean, I look at this more of not so much talking points of the GOP or Fox or Democrats. It really is Washington, more often than not, it's Washington talking point. Sure. It's and, and, and that can trickle down into, uh, in many cases, corporate talking points on trade, on international relations. I mean, when you hear the, de- the supposed liberal, democratic, uh, syndicated columnist basically saying 80% of the same things that George Will is saying in a different way, uh, it becomes it becomes a news speak, as we all know. And, and it really isn't about, it really isn't about GOP or Democrats. It is about this, this group group of people who are always hanging around, they're at the same parties, they go to the same think tanks, they all go to the same beach in South Carolina, you know, to, to vacation and talk about the world. Uh, people like you and I, they never throw people like you and I into the Great American Panel. I mean, imagine if they put a patch reporter on the Great American <laughs> Panel on Hannity. <laughs> I would imagine that there was a time in in the history of American journalism that you would be welcome because you would be part of that small pool to begin with. It seems that the pool has gotten larger, but they're all coming from the same mindset. They're all coming from the same paycheck. I have noticed that over the past few years that NBC, especially MSNBC, is always prefacing a lot of their stories with, in the interest of full disclosure, our parent company, GE, but then never going any deeper than that. Right. So and that's, and that's pretty. That's pretty good. I mean, and I. And I but and then at the same time, I don't think you need to go. I mean, I don't think you need to go overboard with it. You know, if you're if you're doing some, you know, if you had a relationship with somebody 15 years ago and then you're interviewing them now, I mean, there's no need to say, you know, unless you were having an affair with them or were married to them. I mean, there's no really need to disclose some of these. I mean, you know, we get we do get to overexclosure sometimes. Mm -hmm. But the the issue is, I think, with the national coverage and things like that, it really is, are we giving people steak, potatoes, vegetables, and a little bit of dessert, or are we just giving them a massive mud pie, you know, or, or a whoopie pie. I mean, this is all sugar all the time. And some of the networks, I think, you know, 5% of their time is giving people a balanced meal, and the other time it's just it's easier to throw a panel together and let them yell and scream at each other for an hour because it's complicated to do real news, and it is. Well, what I found in the media years ago, I, I worked for a radio station, and we had a test survey of a few hundred people. We set up a hotel room, and we had people come in in groups and play music for them and then we would say of these songs of these few songs which do you like best and then they would pick those songs and the next group would come in and of those songs that they like best the next group would say okay of those songs 
the, the, the previous group pick, which ones do you like best? And then that it got down to, you know, a basically about 40 songs without using any other survey than that. And that determined the playlist of the radio stations. Yep. The radio stations have been doing that for years. The same thing is probably happening to national news is that if everybody likes the way Fox News is presenting or any media outlet and it's successful, then therefore that's the litmus test of of how you gather news and how you distribute news. It's pablum. It, you're right. It's it's like the Red Bull of journalism. It, well, and now Red Bull is good for good for you know before you're about to play a softball game or something. I mean, so let's not you know. Yes, for about five football. minutes and then you crash. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, Red Bull. Red Bull has has a role, but it's not the whole role. You know, it's not Gatorade. It's not the energy bar. It's not uh, uh, the, the, the fruits and vegetables. The, uh, the aspirin cream that you need afterwards. Yes. You know, and that, and I think that's you know one of my and I and I I, I have slacked off on my media criti- criticism. You know, in the, in the last few years, it's been waning, but because it's just so there's just you can make you can make a lifetime out of it. I mean, there's so much to be critical of on both sides. And and it's sometimes easier for me on an issue to just go visit Media Matters and Accuracy and Media and look at what they're saying about about the same type of coverage and 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 that could be very that could be very interesting because there's a lot of different viewpoints when you look at different things when when critics look at different things from different angles that's an excellent what, point tony but you and i are the exception to the rule no, you know. know we are in the business therefore it is our duty and the fact that we have no other life that we spend so much time perusing the media whether it's online or in hard copy internationally to see what's right. going on you know when there's the there's right. an issue when you keep seeing the same story, the same content in source after source. That's suspect. When you see difference of opinions, that then you know you're getting a good mix of what the, the actual true facts are. Now, let me ask you, as a local reporter, has this toothless national media affected your ability to get information that you, as a reporter? need to maintain your journalistic credibility, meaning do you have a problem going out and sticking a microphone in somebody's face and and asking the pertinent questions without that person that you're interviewing saying, wait a minute, this isn't the press release I sent to you, or now playing a role that I will answer the questions in my own way. I think it depends on the situation. I mean, I think for local local news, uh, most of the people... Uh, you know, there, there's me, there's a local radio station with a reporter, and then there's a, and then there's a newspaper that's been around for 150 years with 14 reporters. So, and then we have a TV station in another city that occasionally will drop in a parachute. So, for most of the local people, um, you know, they, they don't really dodge the thing. Even with congressional candidates and gubernatorial candidates, if it's, if it's the question and answer period, and I have something I want to ask, uh, you know, I'll, I'll wait until the TV station gets their question done, and then I'll jump in. And usually most of the candidates uh, or officials are very good about allowing, um, uh, allowing you know, uh, the patch reporter, because we have 10 sites here in New Hampshire, to get in a question. Um, with the presidential primary, we, we saw that depending on the tier, um, you, you had either great access uh, on the lower tier or limited access on the top tier. Um, there were two different times, for example, when Mitt Romney called on me uh, at pre- you know, at press avails, and uh, and I and I uh, gave him you know a hard ball, and he danced around on it. Uh, two, two two different times, uh, you know, I got a, I had got into a uh, great back and forth um, with Newt Gingrich uh, at one of his press conferences. He was complaining about the census data showing that. Um, you have to excuse me. I'm going to a high school graduation here, and I'm just passing by a whole bunch of people doing landscaping. So give me, <laughs> give me 30 seconds if you can't hear me. No, no, this is fine. Now, again, listeners, this is great. This is Tony uh, Chanel uh, from uh, Concord, New Hampshire, Patch, and also politicine.com. He is in the field taking time out of his busy schedule to talk to us today. So, I mean, how great well, is that? You, you're just, you're an icon. So uh, I'm, I'm going to get some shots of, of the massive amounts of people in the field here, and then I'm going to go in the starts around 1030. But anyway, on New Gingrich, he had a press conference, and, and there was a bunch of us there, and they were just kind of taping it. He answered two questions uh, from the State House Bureau, and then the people, and then there was nothing. So I jumped in. And I said, you know, you were talking about this 1996 
census data showing that the median income for most Americans had dropped to 1996 levels. And I said, well, you know, that isn't really about President Obama. I mean, when you were in Congress and you were the speaker and you were working with Bill Clinton, you passed NAFTA, you passed GATT WTO in 1994. And at that point, and we saw a, a huge, massive dip, a correction uh, in manufacturing, which has really hurt American families. I said, in many ways, your role working with the Democrats created this drop since 1996, right? And he kind of looked at me like, oh, my God, I have a hard question. <laughs> and, uh, and he did this kind of, a, you know, little blah, 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 blah thing, and then he, 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 came, he said, well, you know, that's an interesting point because, you know, there have been changes in the way, you know, in the way that job creation and technology and all kinds of different things. Uh, and then he went back to blaming Obama. And, and then he gave me this look, and he was like, you know, had this look on his face like, you got another? And I was like, yeah, actually, I, I, if, I, if, you, if you mind, I do have a couple more. And so I literally had a back and forth with Newt Gingrich for about six minutes, uh, asking him questions and having him answer. And it was, you know, that's the New Hampshire experience. You don't always get that. Um, but, but yeah, you, you couldn't have that experience with, say, a Herman Cain or Michelle or, or, or Michelle Bar- uh, Bachman, excuse me, um, how quickly a, we forget. AstroTurf, <laughs> AstroTurf top tier candidates. They, you know, it was all media driven, all stadiums, all lots of people. You know, hi, how are you? And not a lot of that. Here's a really hard question about what's going on in the world. Well, Gingrich um, fancies himself as an intellect, so he likes to pontificate. So I think that you know you opened the door for him to go on and on and impress people. But on the other hand, you and I are talking this morning. Where is he? So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and and, to, and and but here's the other thing too, and. and and this is not for, you know, this is not, I'm not trying to say New Finger just this great guy. Uh, but to his credit, he did take time to answer serious questions from a local journalist. Sure. And, you know, I, I, I wasn't really necessarily impressed with that, but I respected that. And I was like, okay, wow. He didn't go away and say, thank you very much for the hard question. I'm, I'm leaving now. He let me get in, you know, three hard questions. So, I mean, you don't see that a lot. So it can vary, really, on the local level. It can vary a lot from what you from what you see. Yeah, good for you. We see we have Tony Shinola on the line for a few more minutes. He's the local editor for Concord, New Hampshire Patch and also Politizine.com, a fantastic online magazine. You've, you've got to check it out. 617-237-1234 is the number to call to get in. How are you folks feeling about how you're getting your media, the representation of the media by the local newsies, the talking heads out there? Are we getting uh, more and more dumbed down? Give us a call and, and join in in the fray. Tony, are you finding that the interviews here, uh, you know, you just spoke a little bit about it, but are you seeing any increase in a wag the dog scenario in trying to manipulate the questions that you give either candidates or, or local officials or whoever you're talking to? Well, I think there's a lot of that in no- normally anyway. Um, I mean, I think a lot of people really want to control their message. And it isn't even, it, it isn't even whether it's local or even national or regional. I mean, everybody is so in control of their own message at this point that it gets really, it's really hard to differentiate between what is real and what is not and what is, what is created. So, and I, and I think that that really comes down to not only budget or, uh, you know, staffing or things that you're trying to get done, uh, whether you're a Democrat or Republican or whether you're a city official or not, it really comes down to the, the news organization's ability to gather all of the information that they need to get at any given time. Do they have the staffing? Do they have the time? Are they prioritizing? Are they running around chasing rabbits? Or are they really just doing a whole bunch of things that people want to see? It's very difficult to contain. It's very difficult to organize. It's not easy out here right now. But at the same time, it's exceedingly uh, exhilarating. It's a great time to be in this business because you are meeting uh, you're meeting all kinds of people. Let me, let me give you one other story uh, real quick. Governor Lynch decided last year not to run. Four terms, successful, high poll ratings. No reason to quit. Even if he had a rough uh, campaign again, he's still really popular here. Um, went to this little reading event over in the uh, Eat Lyrics. It was just this really cute event. And he's on the verge of tears, you know, because these kids have just done this really special thing for him, thanking him uh, for, for his service. 
I was one of, uh, there were two of us at that event, two media people. I was the only one who shot video of, of the event. The other newspaper uh, journalist took some pictures, and it was a little photo spread in the newspaper. Gary Lewis and the Playboys, Gary Lewis is at his house someplace in Arizona or Nevada, sees the video, calls the governor to say, oh, I saw this really cool video. Did you know? And he's like, oh, yeah, I was at the event and everything else. So then the governor goes on and he sees the video. And he, pro- he approached me and he, at another event later and was like, oh, thank you for taping that. It was great to relive that moment. It was such a special moment. And we had this conversation, two human beings, not really the governor and a reporter, about this really special moment in his tenure that meant more to him than bills passing or saving people during disaster, storms, or, or, or doing all the technocrat things they like to do. It was this really great thing, and I was the only one there because, and shooting video to capture it. Gary Lewis didn't even know about it. He, he, he saw it on a Google thing. And, and I expect so much cynicism from you, you know, Tony. That's, <laughs> <laughs> I know. How about that? You know, but, but you know, this is the thing. I will always, uh, you know, I'm in my late, I'm in my middle to late 40. I will always remember that moment. I saw a governor on the verge of tears that's over wonderful. something that was that was poetic and uh, and that you know all the time with Newt Gingrich, all the time running around, uh, all of the time that you work, all of the things you're doing day to day. I don't think I'll ever forget that one special moment that this person was able to witness because he made a difference to other people. And you don't get to see that very often. And that's what it's all about, right? That's what it's all about. Yeah. As well as going after corruption and everything. I mean, you know, don't get me wrong, you know. <laughs> You know, we want, to, we want to do all the other things, but, you know, that will I'll always remember. That'll be one of the key moments that probably of my journalism career is remembering this one thing, and I was smart enough to turn the video camera on to catch it. Do you ever blow off a story because there's no there there when the there that's supposed to be there has strings attached to it? Do you catch my drift? Do you just say, you know what, this isn't worth it because I'm not going to follow this edict. I'm not going to follow the talking point. Do you ever just say, I'm not doing this for journalistic credibility or for the fact that maybe there really isn't anything there to begin with? It's, it's a fabricated story. I have to say, I mean, if you gave me a more specific kind of example, you know, I don't usually give up on stories. Mm-hmm. I usually go after stories. And if you don't get them right away, you don't give up the story. Sometimes there are outlandish, crazy things that people want to tell you and they don't want to talk on the record. Those types of things, I tend to go, okay, thank you for sharing that with me, and I leave it until some other little little piece of the puzzle falls into your lap, and then you can kind of go with it. But more often than not, you know, you can always turn something, you know, even with the, like, even with the problem, you know, like we are saying, even when it's a talking point, even when it's a press release to give you, you can always throw it up there and then move on to something else. I mean, I have to, as a patch editor, I have to at least approve, I have to put up at least five to seven things a day, and more often I'm doing 10 to 15 that are on the site at any given time. So you're always looking for angles, you're always looking for things, and um, and you can't do this 24 hours a day. I mean, you do have to sleep and eat, spend time with your family. But on controversial things, no. You don't You don't accept the press release. you you, you got to go after it. But on other things, you know, some sort of song and dance thing, we've just done this thing, here's a couple of quotes, you know, you take a picture and you put it up and you go on to the next thing. Well, good for you. It's a classic example of small media at work doing great things. Tony, again, I'm, I'm not gratuitously sucking up. I admire your work. We spar online all the time, you and me. Yes, we do. <laughs> that is true. And I appreciate that. Mostly I do it just because, again, I have no life. I just do it. <laughs> I, you know... <laughs> On a, on lies, but I guess I don't have any life either. Progressives can be trolls too, you know. <laughs> Tony, I'll let you go, but I thank you so much for being on. We hope we can do it again. Oh, thank you for having me on. It's good to talk to you, Richard, and uh, and I hope Sammy gets back uh, safe and sound from her vacay. She will. Thanks, Tony. That's Tony Shanella. He's the local editor for the Concord, New Hampshire patch, and also politizine.com. That's P-O-L-I-T-I-Z-I-N-E. A political magazine online, just doing great things out of the Granite State, as you have heard, and also a regular contributor here on the Samantha Clemens Show. One of the things that Tony brought up, or we were talking about, is he represents small media, small, local, grassroots, some meat and potatoes media out of the Granite State, and again, doing great things that has a global global impact just to give you an insight as to how media is controlled and who actually owns it back in 2007 
the Center for American Progress did a very comprehensive research and a report called The Structural Imbalance of Political Talk Radio. And you can find this online just by going to the Center for American Progress and or just Googling The Structural Imbalance of Political Talk Radio. Now, again, this was done in 2007, but little has changed since then. If any, it has gotten worse, depending on your perspective. Now, what they found in this report was talking about conservative talk radio undeniably dominating the format. Their analysis in the spring of 2007 of the 257 news talk stations owned by the top five commercial stations owners reveal that 91% of the total weekday talk radio programming is conservative. 9% is progressive. Each weekday, 2,570 hours and 15 minutes of conservative talk are broadcast in these stations compared to what? 254 hours of progressive talk. 10 times as much conservative talk as progressive talk. 2007, now remember, Air America, I believe, was, was still on at the time. That's been chipped away. The separate analysis of all news talk stations in the top 10 radio markets reveal that 76% of the programming in these markets is conservative, 24% is progressive, although programming is more balanced in markets such as New York and Chicago, of course. So that's who's owning the media. That's why it's so difficult for progressives to get their voice across and why it is so important for AM 1510 to be on the air and the great work that Jeff Santos is doing and why stations like this need your support. We're going to take a break right now, but when we come back, we want to take your calls. 617-237-1234. 617-237-1234. You're listening to AM 1510 Revolution Boston. Welcome back to Revolution Boston, AM 1510. I am Richard S. Casimir sitting in for the traveling Samantha Clemens. Sam will be back next week, rested and refreshed. We're talking uh, today about puffball media, the softball questions that the media seems to be increasingly tossing off to, especially political candidates. How is this affecting you in your gathering of news, your uh, consumption of news, and do you even care? Join the conversation, 617-237-1234, 617-237-1234. Joining me now is one of my favorite journalists, Dave Wagle of the Washington, D.C. reporter for Slate.com and former journalist for the Washington Post. He's also a, a frequent contributor to a variety of media outlets that are smart enough to tap into this man's genius and wit. David, thank you so much for coming on today. I really appreciate it. How are you doing today? I'm great. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. My pleasure. In your experience, how deep and or expected is the quid pro quo of media to political party not to stray from the talking points in order to get the interview. Are you seeing that? It's funny you say it. It's, it's not always enforced the way that you know, a, a boss enforces something or an authority figure enforces something. It's, a lot of it is, I think, sort of peer-based and tax-based. There's, there's a impulse to not ask. You know, every, you know, there's, there's nothing theoretically th- stopping somebody from asking a tough question about a topic the person's not, not, you know, got a talking point for every single time we talk to them, um, or every every time you're in a press press conference. There's nothing stopping you from asking that instead of kind of buttering them up for an interview. But the impulse is, I need to kind of make sure that I don't break any, break or bend anything, so I can keep coming back to them. Or if, if you're, you know, if, if you're in a, uh, if you're in a situation of a press conference and shouting questions, the impulse is I don't want to ask something that's that far off, off field because, well, I mean, I, I, I started to finish a sentence. What, <laughs> it's tough sometimes to figure out the impulse. I, I covered um, the campaign pretty closely, and there are a lot of it, a lot of instances where you end up getting one of six questions to a candidate, and everyone kind of ends up asking some kind of easy thing about the momentum or the poll number. Why not ask them about something else? What I've noticed, too, is that, and I don't know if this has to do with uh, just the, the, the dumbing down of, of journalists in general, you know, present company excluded, but it seems that some of the questions that are being thrown out are there for no other reason than for that reporter to have their voice heard or their face on camera. It's almost like asking somebody whose uh, their family has just been murdered, how do you feel? I mean, they are just the dumbest questions that have no basis on what we need to know from the candidate. Do you see that? Yeah, I do. I, it, it, it's tough. You know, I try not to ask those, those things, but there's, there's a point in asking a question that's a little bit soft, possibly, about uh, about how, you know, what somebody agrees. I think it's, you know, there are a lot of questions asked of Mitt Romney, but the one asking him about what his favorite book is that somebody would want, or finding out about her, you know, that's, that's kind of interesting. It's worthwhile to know how, what, how these people behave. Uh, I think the, the, the bigger problem is just letting them talk about the stuff they're already starting to talk about, not kind of following up the facts. Because it's tough. I mean, people trust. I guess the advantage any reporter has is that all they all they are supposed to do is know the topic and 
call someone out for something uh, because you might want to, but you can't. And I think the thing do a lot is responding to attacks from other people. I think I'm, I'm probably even more tired about, uh, about that than you are. Of just the story of the day being somebody saying something, you know, off message and everyone being asked to respond to it. You know, last week, how much time do we spend with the president saying the private sector is doing fine, which is a point he'd been making in a different way for, for months. And instead of talking about economic data, we had, we're asking these guys, so oh, you, do you agree with him? Are you, are you offended by that? It is, it's, like a, it's a big waste of time, and it's, it kind of feeds on itself. Especially when you see that the figures are there that the private sector employer or corporations are holding on to $3 trillion, give or take $1 or $2 trillion in money. So is the private sector doing well or is it not doing well? Which is it? Well, you know, never mind the question. It's a great example because, you know, one way that you could talk about that issue is... Why has the Wall Street recovery so so remarkably? I'm a, I was about to manufacture manufacturers have done, done pretty well. Why have various sectors of the economy recovered? Why are banks making such such um, doing as well as they are? Why is Jamie Dimon able to you know take a multi billion loss the way he is? Instead of that, you're just kind of you know people kind of asking easy questions like I think uh, last week on one of the Sunday shows I saw somebody ask uh, Obama just four times is the is the economy doing fine? No, that's that's not even interesting question. You're just trying to trip them up and embarrass them. I don't want to make it sound like I want people to ask easier questions of Barack Obama. I mean, I think the genius of the Mitt Romney campaign is that he manages to be about as inaccessible as anybody and just kind of feed stuff through both people, and we all we kind of stand for it. I mean, there was an incident this week where Romney was talking to donors at uh, the museum, the news museum in D.C., and reporters were shuffled out during the Q&A section. They, they're aware that reporters aren't exactly going to you know, rebel and refuse to cover his next event because they did that. You can play a lot of games with the press, and they do. That's a good point. We're talking with Dave Wagle, who's the Washington, D.C. reporter for Slate.com. He also used to work for the Washington Post, and just a great guy. I love your work. Thank you. Of the trend of candidates, I mean, you made a good point right there, but the trend of candidates of not allowing press into a press event or allowing questions, what is that all about? And have you personally been denied access to an event or person because of who you are, Dave Wagle? <laughs> well, I mean, I'm sure there are people who, who dislike me enough. To... Actually, once I was, I'd written something that uh, I think Dave Buchanan didn't like if she didn't let me into some conference. But, yeah, that's not that big a deal. It's more that, for whatever reason, a lot of campaign reporting right now involves reporters being being at something where a guy is giving a speech and then getting into a bus, going to the next speech, and not actually getting access to the people he's talking to when he's fundraising or the people he's talking to. There's actually, I think, a business roundtable today that Romney's doing, you know, a meeting with business leaders. And I've, I've attended some of these open to the press, but once they realized they could, they, they didn't need press coverage of these things, they just cut people out. And I'm, it's weird that the media doesn't respond to something more close, you know, why do... What is the point, really, of just going and pointing out that, yes, a guy running for president gave a speech? What's the point if you're not kind of fact-checking it? What's the point if you're not pushing back on the economic hit? Now, look, as I say that, a lot what reporters end up doing is kind of yelling stuff in a rope line, and the, the candidate just doesn't respond to it. Now, I, if, you're, I, if I'm not in a rope line, I'll sometimes it's just, it's just call up a press per- person or, you know, a press person, they just don't respond. So there, there's a lot of, I think, good, good effort by drill. I think a problem, though, is when you get that access, when you get that sit-down, you know, it often isn't, isn't aggressive enough. And you wonder what you're kind of saving it for, right? I mean, what, what is it? If a candidate's going to keep blowing you off, why why go, why go easy on him and give him, half, give him a bunch of softballs in the interview? Because then he's going to, you know, in the case of Mitt Romney, not, he's appearing on his first non-Fox Sunday show of the year this week. You know, what, what, did, what do they get from being, from, from uh, what, what do you get from going easy on a guy? Because I give you one a chance to sit down with him a year. Before the break, I was mentioning the report that the Center for American Progress did back in 2007, the structural imbalance of political talk radio, and how 97% of it, and perhaps even more since 2007, is controlled by conservative corporations. Now, to that point, are the corporations that own the media, obviously with those statistics, are spending millions of dollars in PAC money to support a conservative candidate? Therefore... Are you restrained? Again, I'm not speaking for Slate. Have you ever been given an edict, like when you go out there as a reporter, uh, to? Uh... No, no, you're not. You're not told that. Like, I, I think the point to make is it's much more. I must use the word kind of corporate in this, the literary sense. There's just more. This, there are a bunch of people doing the same thing in a mentality form. It becomes um, unexpected and upsetting of the apple cart to ask a question that is putting somebody down an issue that's not being covered now. I remember, you know, here's an example of this. The 60 Minutes did a series about how members of Congress might use their knowledge to uh, find out inside information, the insider trading. And 60 Minutes showed up on the Hill 
and kind of use the first three minutes of the weekly Boehner and Pelosi press conferences to ask them questions about this with a bunch of cameras. And you can never feel in the room who had to file later that day on something else a little bit irritated. You know, not all of them. Some were like, well, this is interesting. What's the story? And it doesn't make sense. Like, look, you know, was the, but why, why rattle the guys like this? And then I think after it was over, there's a like, well, we just the <laughs> Maybe not on that issue, but why not just throw these guys a bunch of wild pitches instead of asking for their message? And there's far too much uh, reporting and, and coverage of what the narrative is, what the message is. I think, I think you know, the job of people covering anything, you're like, look, let's say a fabric softener company rolls out a new fabric softener. All right, you can talk about how their, what the start of their ad campaign is, but you probably are more interested in whether it softens fabric. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's often left, left aside in political journalism. It's, well, forgetting if this economic plan makes any sense or adds up, how does it, how does it answer the other person's message? Sure. And it, 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 as, as anyone consumes news, it's got to be really frustrating because not, not, you're not learning anything about the world except for what uh, one campaign wants another campaign to do. Well, explain to me this other aspect, Dave, of the seemingly growing trend for reporters, predominantly from the biased liberal media, to be arrested, detained, or otherwise physically removed from a media event. And again, for asking the wrong questions or for being who they are. Has has the legality of these removals been challenged? And if so, why isn't that making news? There are private, there are buildings owned by private institutions. There are hotels that somebody has paid, has paid to rent and the contract lets them put whatever they want in there. And, you know, maybe some lawsuit will be won somewhere that says anyone can go anywhere. Generally, we let people pay money to, to keep, you know, keep people out of events or, you know, to keep bringing what they want into events. You see a lot of investigative journalists trying to film. I mean, this is probably the most important issue in politics right now is just who's giving money to fund what campaigns and what causes, right? And you, you see a lot of investigative journalists try and film just meetings where people are discussing who they're going to give money to, uh, maybe a ALEC or, or um, Koch Foundation summit where people are talking about what initiatives they want to support in the state. And it's in a hotel, so you'll get kicked out. And there's, there's not a good way to do it, but I think the um, the impulse to cover that, story, that, that is, a, is a good one. And I think good reporters, like I uh, went to Ken Vogel of Politico, realize that what you just need to do is go back, find out who went there, talk to them, get as much as you can and then throw that back at the people getting the money. I mean, it's tough to report. It's tough to report on something like that and pretty easy to report on whether somebody has a zinger about a rival zinger. I mean, uh, I'm kind of repeating myself, but you know, the, the money and politics stories are tough and there are legal reasons why you can't find out everything. There are reasons why you can't find out who donated what money to what campaign until a month later. And uh, a lot of good impulse in journalists to follow up on that, but maybe not enough of taking it back to the candidate. Before I let you go, Dave, I want to go to the other extreme of the puffball questions. I want to play a cut from the president's press conference on immigration that was held yesterday at the White House Rose Garden. The president is in the middle of his statement when Neil Monroe, the Daily Caller, interrupts the president several times with questions. Right. Now, I know you've heard this. You probably won't be able to hear this on the phone, but I just want to play this for our listeners. This is a temporary stopgap measure that lets us focus our resources wisely while giving a degree of relief and hope to talented, driven, patriotic young people. It is the, it is the right thing to do. Excuse me, sir. I, I, it's not time for questions, sir. I, I, not while I'm speaking. Precisely because this is temporary, Congress needs to act. And the answer to your question, sir, and the next time I'd prefer you let me finish my statements before you ask that question, is this is the right thing to do for the American people. Bay Bika, I, I, didn't, I didn't ask for an argument. I'm answering your question. It is the right thing to do for the American people, and here's why. Here's the reason. Because... These young people are going to make extraordinary contributions and are already making contributions to our society. No matter what you say about the president, he can deal out a beatdown, I tell you. Now, it's hard to hear Monroe in the background, but in essence, what he's shouting to the president is why the president is favoring foreigners over American workers with this immigration reform. Yeah, and parenthetically, yeah. he's an Irish, a naturalized Irish citizen. So mm-hmm. when he says foreigners, we told different than, you know, a guy with a T-shirt yelling at somebody. <laughs> Outside of that, but he's a uh, yeah. That's what he was trying to yell. It wasn't a very good. It wasn't a very good question. Without getting to an existential uh, essay on what a good question is, you know, it wasn't even. It was intended to kind of irritate him more than get an answer. But is he a credible journalist? I mean, you, you're excusing what he was doing, the disrespect to the office and to the journalism because he's Irish. <laughs> No, I was just when when you use the word foreigner, that's all, that's all I'm, I'm saying. Oh, I no, see. This is this is actually this is not that type of case. You shouldn't. I mean, in, in any circumstance, I think you know people should not interrupt people who are talking. But but 
you understand the impulse of, according to the Daily Caller. Now, they, they've, they've kind of tried to soft pedal this because they don't like to ban from every press conference ever. But their first response was, look, you know, we're there to ask, ask questions and nobody, nobody else was. And you do, I feel like it's a twinge of sympathy to that, that it's depressing that the president or the governor or anyone can just, but usually the, usually the president or a candidate can call the press to something, make a statement, and then go away. Because then what they have, I've been in this situation many times, right? What the press ends up being in a position of doing is just kind of you know, writing about ambiance in the room and deciding what made sense from the text of the speech. But you don't actually get to report on it in a sustained way. So you understand the theory behind this, and you understand why there's not a lot of people defending what he did. But there's generally, generally I think, uh, frustration with how the media doesn't, doesn't either ask the right questions or doesn't ask enough. The president now like i just keep wanting to circle back and say generally the way to do this is not to interrupt somebody mm-hmm. <laughs> if you if, if it's established reports is going to interrupt the president he's going to limit access the president should generally i think be kind of goaded into making himself more available to reporters period uh and you know like reporters should be maybe not ask a question of how this will benefit foreigners but ask something specific about you know like the numbers here i mean this is why they did this what pressure he got the economic effects and whether they've been tested because it's only really 800,000 people i think part of that question are very real. Tucker Carlson, yeah. the co-founder and editor-in-chief of the Daily Caller, defended Monroe's shout down by yeah. saying that this is what reporters do. They're supposed to get their questions right. answered. Well, yeah, there is, but there's a time and a place and there's a protocol. This isn't it. I could ask the question, when did this loathsome disrespect for the office of the presidency become standard operation for the media? But I think we know that. And that was when he was inaugurated. <laughs> Well, no, I mean, the, uh, I think a couple of key moments of uh, lost trust in the media, like, it's been going on for a while. But I think for liberals, a lot of the trust degraded after the Iraq war, when it turned out that reporters who were close to, you know, close to the Pentagon, covering the Pentagon every day, maybe Judy Miller, who was covering Iraq uh, sources every day, actually had bogus information were being used, right? They, you had this great trick where, you know, Dick Cheney would leak something to the New York Times, and then he would go on TV and say the New York Times reporting something. I think for, for conservatives, you know, Really, for decades, they haven't trusted the media. But since the um, Dan Rather story for CBS, uh, George Bush's National Guard Service, right? They've, they said we just can't trust the, these people, and uh, we we can't trust the, we can't trust these institutions. We can't trust these people. I think you've got that problem generally. You get the trust back. I mean, I think it's just when you get demanding more access, and then when you get the access, it has to be something kind of fact based, right? And it's, it's hard not to sound like a school marm when you talk, you talk about it. But the way the depressing thing about, about the media at the moment is that when we don't have that, we end up kind of filling the air with people just verbalizing about the mistakes somebody just made or a new attack at. You know, you it's, it's actually kind of a mystery to me. We've got infinite space in the Internet, and, you know, you add up all the cable news networks, you know, 96 hours a day of, of coverage, right? And how much of it ends up being just kind of ephemera, right? Quite a lot of it. Is it still fun for you, Dave? Oh, no. I mean, it, it, it's very it's very fun. I mean, it, it, it's in, like, the, the selfish interest of people who cover politics at some level for some of the coverage to be, to be uh, lousy so you can... You can say, well, I mean, any investigative reporter is at least, a, or I'm not, I'm not much, I'm not actually much of a, uh, more investigative reporter, more of a campaign reporter and a kind of in- movement reporter. Um, but any kind of reporter would like it, you know, is, is glad that 500 people aren't on the same, on the same, uh, beat. But it is frustrating to see a weak campaign news turn on something kind of trivial. And it's like, it's not just me ranting about this. I think, uh, um, Brian Lizza at the New Yorker this week just kind of went on a series of digressions about how it's really horrible that because campaigns don't give people access anymore. We end up kind of talking about what they want us to talk about. He was speaking for a lot of people. The food is better on the campaign trail than being an investigative reporter anyway. Not that good. (laughs) <laughs> it's not that good of. We've been talking with Dave Wagel, Washington, D.C. reporter for Slate.com. That's uh, W-E-I-G-E-L. Find him on Slate.com. He's an incredible reporter. Dave, I thank you so much for coming off at short notice. I hope we can do it again. Oh, thank you. Have a good show. All right, take care. You're listening to AM 1510, Revolution Boston.